one, we are good. Well, um, I definitely think that this has been a long time coming. I mean, we've been needing to do this for a long time. And what I'm talking about is this podcast. And it's to get our ideas and these concepts and these things that are happening in people's houses every day out to the world. And I'm Eric Gans, and I've got Kyle Farrell with me today. What's up, Kyle? Hey, what's up, Eric? <laughs> so tell me, um, Kyle, I think the first thing we said we want to do today is just talk a little bit about how we got into this field. And that'll shed some light, I think, on exactly what this field is so people can understand you know, what it's all about and why it's important. Sure. Yeah, definitely, man. Definitely, definitely. Uh, so for me, I jumped in like a little bit after school. It was like 2012. I graduated in 2010 and started air sealing, just like air sealing houses, man. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd go into like a bunch of like chain builder houses, Bob Ward, like Williamsburg. Those are like the big, big ones out yes. towards you in Columbia. Um, and then like Clarksville area, they're out there as well. And I would see like start to finish what the house looks like framing, um, you know, open, no trades have gone through. We'd look at the house and see what's going on. See if I can get like a head start on where I need to do things at and then seal everything. So the code for new houses is three air changes. We'd have to get it down to that and see like the testing portion as well. So I could questions <laughs> sure okay yeah. first question so you're saying you graduated high school right right what year was that 2010 yeah, <laughs> yeah. and at a high school you were working with builders with builders well with with energy services group energy so service. okay m- my girlfriend at the times father's friend worked for them as an area manager and he said that they needed some people. I was like looking for a position somewhere and I jumped in. Gotcha. And yep. your first position with them was to do air sealing. Yep. Like an air sealing technician. That's what they called the position. Air that sealing technician. Thing. Yeah. And that was back in 2010. And you were doing what exact? 2012. Sorry. What exactly okay. were you so doing? So we would run through a house. And before the drywall. Before the drywall. And... We would, if you you think about like straight to the top floor of the house clockwise, we would picture frame every wall cavity. So, you know, seal it exactly like a picture frame looks. Then we would seal the bottom stud. So, you know, no air would come in from the the OSB sheathing, you know, through the bottom stud and into the house. We would seal all the corners. We would seal all the windows and doors, you know, with low E, low E foam and then orange fire block foam with everything else. We would seal all the penetrations going up into the attic. We would seal all the chaseways, so like plumbing, plumbing stacks, um, you know, anything, any any kind of dead space leading into the attic. We would seal all that stuff, mm-hmm. and then we would do that every floor, all the way down, right? Mm-hmm. Anything that leads outside of the house, anything that leads into a garage. So for garages, we would like if there's open bays that lead in to the kitchen. Usually, the kitchen kind of like jumps off of the garage. Mm-hmm or a mud room would jump off the garage. We would seal the bays that lead into the garage from there. So mm-hmm. put like foam board in, block it, seal it, make sure no air comes in. And uh, then we would hop into the basement and do all the rim joists, anything leading out like HVAC stuff. Usually there's like one line set going out and then the wire that goes out to it, the electrical, the main electrical line will be down in the basement. Um, all the rim joists, top, bottom, sill plate, all that stuff. We would just go through and seal everything. Got it. So I have a question about that. So sure. when you first got into it and you started doing it, were you just sort of spraying the phone where people told you to, or were you fully understanding exactly, you know, why and what you were doing at that point? I had no idea. I had no <laughs> idea. Yeah. I was just like spraying from all over the place. And even Wayne, Wayne was like, Wayne was my, uh, Wayne was the guy that was like training me. And then Tom, Tom Marston, he's actually like, really heavy into everything i think he just retired he like just recently retired was really heavy into like energy efficiency field yeah um he gave me they both gave me so many pointers on everything 
yeah. and we're like super super patient which is really important definitely on uh on training me yeah the reason why i asked that question too is because i just think that the biggest thing that i want people to understand is that it takes a process to go from you know just living in a house to fully understanding the importance of these things and how to do them and where to do them and why to do them so i just think that's really important for people to understand because it's not going to be as easy to understand as putting in windows right no 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 no, not at all like we're literally in our minds if we're doing an energy audit right we are breaking down the house into segments and imagining it as if it doesn't have drywall right Right. Sometimes like if it's just like bare frame or like in order to find like holes and cracks and crevices to think about it in like a completely different way than what you would normally think of a house. I always call it x-ray vision. You have to right. be Superman. <laughs> you have right. to be able to look through the wall. Yeah. And then like infrared, infrared, we're imagining like what's, what's going to be. And then, you know, figuring it out. Right. It's so, awesome. so you started with ESG, you started, how long were you with them? I was with them for roughly up until AGHS, so I'd say until like 2017, I think, or 20. 2000. When did you start with AGHS? 2017. So yeah, up until 2017. Yeah, so for a very long time. Yeah, you were there uh, five years. Five years. Yeah, I was like two years Air Seal Tech, and then I jumped into. Uh, I jumped into like ResNet ratings, ResNet uh, inspections and ratings, which is like inspecting the work, right? So doing blow door tests, going in for like Energy Star inspections to make sure the installa insulation is installed properly. Um, so you were in there after thermal breaks, yeah, and you were seeing all the problems, right? How so you were doing it for two years, and then how long were you inspecting? I was inspecting. I, it was like dual. So I inspected, I managed, I scheduled everything. That was like up until up until the end there, up until the end, up until 2017 when I jumped to EDHS. And it was all new construction? All, all new construction, but then I started auditing as well. Like it was a mix. I did for the last two years, I did auditing ResNet and ResNet inspections. I kind of like slowed down on the air sealing portion of things. And I was just doing like inspecting. Got it. Right. Got it. So once you graduated up and you started doing inspections and then you were talking about you moved to a different company? Moved to EGHS, yeah. So that was yeah, 2017. That was 2017 and I was like solely auditing at that point. Yeah. Um, You know, we were with, we were with BG Home, so we were just cranking away. There were so many leads with everything. Yeah. You're familiar. Yeah, it's... It was a lot, a lot. So you've been doing this. We, you know, you've been in this field since 2012. So that's what, uh, 11 years, right? Yeah. 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 yeah a long oh. time. Yeah, yeah. A lot of audits, a lot of houses sealed. I still like, I pass by neighborhoods sometimes. And I'm like, oh, I sealed that house. I, I did, uh, <laughs> yeah. I did like the blow it on that house and make sure that, you know, everything met, met criteria. I did a duck test on this house. Yeah. And an energy star inspection on this house is cool. Definitely. It's cool. A lot of neighborhoods. Yeah. What's cool yeah. sometimes is also going out, doing an audit in a neighborhood, and then going like three years later and doing another house in the right. neighborhood. That's like the same one. You know where to look to, right? Yeah. It's like a good thing. Oh, well, it's yeah. different. It's it's usually different in some yeah. cases. But yeah. Cool. That's awesome, man. So what else you what else you wanna put out there for the world to know? Um I'd say up until up until this point, um, you know, I, I audited over at ADHS for a while, then I started like crew management over there, ordering everything, tracking everything. Yeah, that's and good. then so get us up to speed that's good. So get us up to speed from okay, so you started working with AGS. Get us up to speed to where you are now. Right. Right. So AGHS I did you know, a lot of, a lot of tracking and, and figuring out what was going on. They didn't have anyone that were, or that was like tracking business expenses, right? right. Like ultimately like figuring out what the profit was for each individual job. We kind of just like ballparked it until, until I came in. Until you came and in. And then. 
and if I remember correctly, not to cut you off there, but because we were sure. working together, that's that's where we overlapped and that's where we met, and we'll kind of get into yeah. that a little bit. But yeah, if I remember correctly, you were also really focused in on material cost and labor right. cost and making sure that, as you said, that the company was profitable and you got a really good understanding of all of the you know costs of all of this stuff. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then that so that was like a huge portion of things, and then also like making sure that the job went smoothly, right? That the customer was happy and knew what was going on at every stage of the work, because that's like super, super important when it comes to managing any job is like, people like to know what's going on in their house, right? If they're going to spend, you know, five to 10,000 to even $15,000 on their house, they want to know, like, is this being done right? Who's working on what? Who's, who's like, where are people in my house? Right. Right. They want to know these things. So we, we developed like a good format of like, you know, I, w- I would let the customer know. And then I trained, you know, a couple of people to, to let them know like, hey, look at this. Hey, look at that. Explain to the customer what's going on. So they're like happy with things. Get pictures, tons and tons and tons of pictures. Sure, we can catalog everything and give it to the customer. So they have something to take other than just to work with them. Right. Right. Because right. a lot of the stuff like the attic work and mainly the attic work, right? They probably people probably won't step foot in their attic again. They can't. Right. You know, there's like twenty twenty inches, twenty inches of insulation in their attic. It's fiberglass, right? Right. Uh they're not going in. They're not going in again. So right. it's nice to have those things to know what's like underneath of all the insulation, all the work that we did there and then all the prep and staging and all that stuff too. It's really, really So you cool. developed uh, just a good communication yeah. model so that the customer just knew what was going on every step of the way. Yep. And a good system from like start to finish that we were like in and out of houses relatively quickly. Some, you know, some things sometimes you have like hiccups and it takes a little bit longer, but try to keep it to so, a tight timeline. Got it. So tell me, cause I, I lost track a little bit. Um, cause I was out doing the audits and you were obviously doing all of that and we weren't really crossing paths every day how did you then graduate into or get into the bath fans and how you did you become such a specialist in that i was just curious i was very curious right and i did i had done some i had done some over at esg as well just like with the with the crews i would go out randomly with them and just see what's going on i was very curious i wanted to know how it worked it was like the hardest portion of the job only one person could do it right which was Ricky, you know, he was the only one that did any of that stuff. He was the only one that felt comfortable venting through the roof. And I was like, I, I want to be able to do this. Yeah. You know, I want to be able to like, I want to be able to do every step of the, the process. I feel like I'm more of like an asset that way. Right. Sure. Like if I could step in for someone that oh, there's only one person that can do it. What happens if he calls out? Right. Like <laughs> we're, we're like in a rough spot. We're in a rough right. spot and we can't do anything. We can't move forward. We have to wait until he, he gets back in to do these other portions of the job and that stops everything. Right. So like cross train, cross train ultimately. Cool. And then yeah, that was it's fun. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. The bath fan part's probably like the funnest out of everything, I think, personally. And so yeah, it, it's definitely I think one of the more challenging parts. But sure. just to sum it all up for you, it's like you in the past eleven years since twelve you right. from the ground zero you became you, you learned how to air seal you understood like the the you know importance of insulation where it's supposed to go right you managed crews and come up with systems on how to you know get jobs done in a timely manner right all the way up to becoming a specialist on you know ventilation and getting exhaust fans so that's quite i mean that's that's a lot <laughs> that's really yeah. good yeah yeah it's yeah. impressive it's, it's exciting uh, it's impressive. Yeah. So tell me, how did you, you know, what you, now you're doing what? So now, you know, you're, you're the one that kind of like As brought, me in, uh, brought <laughs> me into everything, right? <laughs> um, so I started working with you. I want to say, what was that, like 21? 21 I think it was 21, 20? yeah. Maybe 21. 20. Yeah, 21. like end of, end of 20, something like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I reached out to you and I had known like, yeah, you started your own, you started your own business. And I was like, Hey man, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see, 
like everything that you've been doing man i saw that you were like putting up videos and like just like exciting stuff stuff that like no one was doing right 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 like it's it's like like advancements in the field right like you start as like most people will have most companies will have like a website but they'll like take it the extra step right and do like videos and and anything that's going to give people like a better grasp on how things are done right sure so we started working together you had some things pop up we were kind of like like going back and forth with uh with certain jobs and then i decided to to ultimately like leave agehs and yeah. and that to me real quick not to keep cutting you off but it's like no no it's really cool ideas yeah it's yeah. to me i one thing i want you to remember that you may not have recalled is that the way we can reconnected because we were working together pretty close at the end once COVID. yeah hit. Uh, yeah. we, you and I got partnered up. We were doing stuff with uh, uh, like office buildings or something. Right. But, but we connected about a year later on LinkedIn. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, and I just wanted to say that because I think that it's really cool how you can really, you know, utilize social media for the right things in your life. Definitely. But anyway, back to you. Yeah. So you made a huge change. And how's it been? It's been awesome, man. Yeah. It's been awesome. Yeah, it's been it's been so much fun. Yeah. And then it's like, all right, so there's there's like a couple things, right? There is you know with with any company you work for ultimately get a lot of pressure for everything, right? You know, sure. timelines and it's 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 needed to an extent, right? Mm -hmm. But then if you get too much pressure, for me personally, right? If I'm if I'm constantly being pressured on things, it makes me not want to do them, right? <laughs> like it makes me like be like, oh man, like uh, I, uh, or you know, I, I guess in some cases it makes me want to do them faster. Yeah, but yeah. it's it's just depending depending on like situation situation and how it ends up uh, ends up popping up. Um, you know, there's no pressure. There's no yeah. pressure on anything. Yeah. I feel like I'm being, you know, fairly paid money wise when it comes to everything. So I have more of like a reason to push forward, right? More motivation. More motivation. Yeah. I, I feel like, you know, I'm, I make my own schedule ultimately with anything. I've gotten a lot of like, uh, a lot more experience with like everything as a whole, everything as a whole from like the management side of things to like scheduling the job to scheduling audits to like everything, everything. Sure. And you're actually even building your own website right now? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm building a website and doing like tinkering with SEO and stuff. That's like a ton of fun, really challenging, uh, but really fun. Yeah. Really fun because it's like I get to see like how people's minds, it's, it's cooler to see the bigger picture, right? When you go and you search for something as like a consumer, it's like, oh, okay. I'm going to look for like some shoes or something, right? Mm -hmm. You don't think about what someone puts into a website to be able to draw you to like, to ultimately make a decision. Right. Like it's, it's awesome. It's yeah. awesome. So you get to see like the big picture of like how, how you can help someone from like, without them even noting, knowing, yeah. knowing it's crazy. You know what they call that? What is that? They call it the customer journey. A customer journey. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> it's true. They do. They right. Do. When I say they, I'm talking about the SEO people. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, it's neat. It's neat. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, well, I just, you know, I, I wanted you to just kind of get it out there, like I said, to the world. I mean, what you're doing. And I think it's really, um, I just think it says a lot about people that are willing to break off and try their own thing. And I think people that, you know, are looking to get work done in their home, especially this type of work, should be looking for guys like us, guys that are, you know, motivated and excited about what we do and, you right. know, just, you know, doing it because, you know, we're just out there, we're on our own, we're not, yeah, I don't know, you know what I'm trying to say. Small, yeah, and small too, like, you know, nationally, uh, I get like too far into this portion of things, like nationally owned companies are like really, really large companies. It's hard to like, you know, I, th I think about it in like a school standpoint, right? When I was younger, I had problems in school. I was lucky enough to be in a small school where the teachers cared a little bit more because they were small. It was right. a small class, right? So they would put a little bit of extra attention on me. 
And with a small company, it's like, it's just us. Right. So it's, it's us focusing all of our individual attention. We're not, we're not getting like dogged out to the point where we're doing like 50 million audits a week. And it's, it's challenging for us to like, to, to give a a ton of attention to one specific audit. Quality. Quality. Yeah. Versus quantity. Right. Yeah. I've definitely found that too. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I'm curious, Eric, how did you get into the like energy auditing, energy efficiency field? Oh, wow. You really want to ask me that? I do. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. God, I have been, this has been like years in the making for me. Okay. Um, so back in 2006, I left Hilton Hotels. So I had a really good job, you know, nice salary and everything, insurance, good boss. And I decided to get into business with a friend of mine who had started a window replacement company about three years prior to when I joined. So he started in 2003 and I, you know, got on board about 2006. And the reason why that's important is because important part of the story is because I, you know, didn't know anything about being a contractor or houses or windows or anything like that. But I did know how to treat people and I know how knew how to, you know, make people feel comfortable. And so what I did is um, I worked with him from 06 to 2015 and we just, you know, focused in on the customer experience and making sure that the windows were ordered and the, they came in in a timely manner and that if somebody had a complaint, you know, that we were just there. You know, I always, in the hotel industry, I learned that, you know, when people had a problem with their hotel room, the best thing to do to solve it is just go see them face to face. You know, they right. can't really, you know, people are going to feel much better about a problem being solved. So I took that same mentality to the home improvement industry. And if somebody had a worry about their window or they were concerned because their roof looked like it was wavy, you know, I went out there and took a look at it and and worked with them in person. But unfortunately, you know, because of many, many reasons, which I won't get into now, in 2015, the company just, you know, we, we just couldn't sustain. We, we were just spending a little bit too money on aver- much money on advertising. And we had to close the doors and it was, you know, heartbreaking and it was very difficult time in my life. But, you know, in hindsight, I'm really glad it happened. And the reason I say that is because I think I found my true passion. And what that is, is home performance. And in 2017, I, so that's two years after going out of business, I still really hadn't found myself. I I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was barely making ends meet. And I stumbled across the Building Performance Institute, and I started reading about, you know, the different jobs and the different certifications, and it was really interesting. And I felt like I would be a really good fit because I've always had sort of an analytical type of mind. But anyway, fast forward, I got a job as an energy auditor in pretty much early 2018. That's where I met you at AGHS in Baltimore. And I just put my head down and got to work. And what I mean by that is once I got my certification, I felt like that was just the beginning of my education because I started to do energy audits and all of the things that I was learning in class that I didn't quite get, it all started becoming very clear to me why it's important, how it all works, and not only that, but how to fix the problems. So that's where we are today. Um, Other than a small part in there, which would be COVID, and that kind of put me in front of my computer one day, and I just started writing. And what I mean by that is I had all of these experiences out in the field doing energy audits, and it was like I couldn't even contain you know, all of these ideas and this information, because remember to take a step back, I was in windows and roofing. So I was already a marketer, you know, I like to put a message out and get the phone to ring. I wanted to, you know, people to buy windows from me. So I kind of had that 
in me. Once I had time and COVID hit and I sort of sat back and I sat in front of my computer, I started a blog. And lo and behold, people started calling. And, you know, that's kind of where I am right now. So nice. how does that sound? <laughs> that's good. That's very good, man. Very good. And I like how, all right, so like the, the experience with Helton is like huge, right? Yeah, definitely. Because ultimately, you know, a, a customer friendly or a, yeah, because a customer friendly experience is like, it's huge. It's huge. It's huge. It makes all the difference in the world if things are pleasant along the way. Absolutely. And like, that's all anyone could ask for in any, any like contracting situation. I haven't, man, there's so many, so many experiences. You know, when we sit down and we do an audit with someone, people are like kind of like apprehensive because they've had a bad experience in the past where someone wasn't like communicative with them. Right. Or like right. they just like drop off after, after work is completed or, or like, don't follow up in the beginning with anything. It's like fuzzy. And I, you know, Ooh, ooh I got one ooh. or they're pushy. Right. Or they're, they're super pushy, pushy right. They're They right. want to make the sale. How many times have you just, you know, in the years you've been in this, have you heard the story about, Oh yeah, you know, they gave me one price and I wasn't comfortable. And then they dropped the price and right. they dropped it again. And then on the way right. out the door before the guy even got in his car, he dropped the price a fourth time. It's like, why did he, why didn't he offer me his best price the first time? Right. And that's, that just, that just happened with Mr. Anderson, like two weeks ago, I had an audit out in like the uh, Montgomery County area. And he was like, yeah, I had a roof guy come out and he was like something like, what I think he said around like twenty thousand, and then he was like eighteen thousand, sixteen thousand, exactly the way that you said it. And he was just <laughs> like, "All right, so yeah, right." I didn't want anything to do with with anything. Yeah, it's not <laughs> like know, reasonable. I literally, when it hit me that I was in a completely different field than selling windows and roofing, right. even though those are important things, don't get me wrong. Sure. But it was the day that I was doing an energy audit and I was putting in 14 um, um, uh, floodlights into a kitchen for a woman and I was and it was a nine foot ceiling. So I had to get up on like a ladder and everything. It was before I was smart enough to get a little step stool. I just used my, you know, um, my gorilla 13 foot <laughs> the right. metal one. I would bounce it around the kitchen. But anyway, I was sweating my, you know what, and, my, and the lady's like, she's like, are you sure? that I only have to pay you a hundred dollars for this. And I'm right. like, yeah, yeah. She's like, cause I, I don't know. You've been working so hard for like two hours. And I got to tell you, like my refrigerator guy comes just to look at the refrigerator. I got to pay him 80. <laughs> I was <Right>. like, <laughs> so I just knew right from that point. I don't know right. why for me it would, but it was like, this is a completely different world that I'm in right now. And I yeah. love it. Yeah. It's awesome, man. It is. It's awesome. I mean, you get, you get to give people like so many things. So on many the process. Things. So, so many, many things. So many to be things. comfortable in your own house is like so important. That's huge. Yeah. And 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 it's something that people they don't even think it's attainable. Something right. Because their house is, and, and this is not a dig, but it's just it's really in bad shape. Now that doesn't yeah. mean structurally; it just means from an insulation standpoint, from a from a protective standpoint, it's in bad shape. And they think that you know there's just no hope, but no, no. With a few tweaks here and a little bit of muscle there and a, a few innovative ideas there, no, you can have a nice, comfortable home. So right, all right, right. right. Now, this to me is the reason why we want to do this podcast. And I think this is going to be at least initially the format. And what we're going to do, and we talked about this, I know, but we're just going to talk a few, you know, a little bit about some of the interesting problems that we've maybe faced in, in, a, in a week. And right, right. That's going to be the next part of the show here. I just want to ask you, because we've both been out in the field this past week, and I just wanted to ask you, you know, what interesting problems have you come across because this is going to be how we help people if we can and then i'm going to let you speak if we can identify some of these recurring problems the people that listen when they're in their home and they see these things around their own house they're going to know how to fix them right so tell me Kyle, what what something that you found this week that was interesting i'll jump back a couple a couple weeks ago to we recently started working with this company, like JES. They do um, 
And they do crawl space encapsulations, like a really, really bang up job on crawl space encapsulations, right? They'll lay down like a crazy amount of vapor barrier. Um, I think they go down to like, I think they go down to like, or up to like 20 mil. And then they put padding down. They do like two inch foam board all across the walls. So what you're saying is somebody could actually set up a TV and live in their crawl space. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's clean. It's clean. So then we go in and we like file, file rebates for them for that. Um, most of the crawl spaces are in very rough shape prior, which is, you know, why they're there. And I went to an audit. She was super cool. Um, Irish. We, yeah. I, I noticed some like fuzzy things around our house. You know, we were doing like a walkthrough in the beginning of an audit. We sit down for 15 minutes. We talk about what's going on generally, right? Mm-hmm. We get a, a rough layout of the house from walking up to it. And then she uh, she gives me a tour of everything. She's showing me things. I'm noticing like there's like mold spotting on the outsides of the house, front and back to the eaves. She had had issues with like a ton of heat buildup in that specific spot. Mm-hmm. They installed soffits. Had a roofing company come out and install vented soffits all the way through. Like beautiful job too. Like I get up in the attic and I could I could see there's so much light coming through the soffits. I can okay. see. But this this mold build up on the outside Where, wait, wall. Where's the mold? It's like it's it's enough to wipe off. It's not a crazy amount, but it's it's like if you're looking at like the front of a house. It's a rancher, so it's a basic box. Um, so, if you look at the front and the back of the house, like that corner where it meets the soffit almost. Okay. Uh, there were just like spots here and there of like of buildup, and what was happening is like wind washing eventually happens once they did put the soffits in. The wind catches the underside of the uh, the wind catches the underside of the soffit, and then any loose like blown insulation, if there's no baffle stopping it, like a baffle, you know, redirects the air to the ridge vent at the top of the peak of the roof. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it doesn't stop that, it pushes the insulation back once the wind catches it. Mm. So there are a ton of spots in the attic. When you look down towards the soffits, the outside wall is not insulated at the top because the wind pushed all of it back. Mm. So in the it'll happen mainly in the summertime, right? Mm. Where it's super, super hot outside and then cool inside. It condenses right at that spot where there's no there's no insulation at because it's it's very you know it's very hot in the attic and it's very cold in the inside of the house. It's like when you take like uh, anything out of the refrigerator and you get like a little bit of moisture on the outside of it. Mm-hmm. That temperature difference creates like a a dew point ultimately. Like, exactly. And mold builds up Wait. all along that. So the mold that was observed was on the inside wall inside. or the outside. Inside of the house. Okay. Inside of the so house. Inside yeah. of the house. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So the I heat that was the heat from the attic was because it was. I'm sorry. I just want to make sure I clarify. Sure. Yeah, so yeah. prior, and I want to make sure I understand. So prior to you coming to do the audit, and prior to having right. the soffit, the open soffit installed, there was right. no issue. There was no issue. Yeah. So, well. Well, it was. It was hot. It was hot because there was no ventilation in the attic. It was just hot overall in the house. Yeah. It was hot in the house. But yeah. as far as the mold, that showing a sign, there was no issue. Once the soffit was installed and the wind washing took place and removed or, or pushed the insulation away from that area, that allowed the heat from the attic to migrate through to the cold side, which is the inside wall. And then you saw a little bit of black mold right. that you were able to wipe away. Right. But what you're saying is during the process of the audit you were able to determine why that that occurred yeah yeah yeah, yeah. definitely yeah, that yeah, it was awesome too it was like clear cut clear yeah. cut like and then the you know the solution is sealing it putting a baffle in place that way wind washing doesn't happen and then insulating it properly right, so, okay so let's see because i feel like a lot of people you know when i go out and do audits and, and i say seal it i don't know you know it's like i feel like they're looking at me sometimes like a deer in headlights and i try sure. to recognize that so f- even though i know we're just talking right now but we right, can put right. some video on some of the places we're going to put this but tell me sure when you say seal it just what does that mean so on the outside wall there is no where wall. are you though where in are the you? attic like okay. if you think about like from the attic if you go to the outside wall, the the eaves where you can see into the soffit, right, there will be an outside wall, which you can also see from below. 
But it's drywalled, right? It's your exterior wall. Your exterior basically. wall. Yep. Okay. Got yep. it. Now, if you look down, you'll see uh, the top of the wall. Right. And then you'll see where the drywall meets it in the corner right there. And then you'll also see the sheathing and a little piece of the siding that's attached from the outside. Right. So in order to seal it, you would have to uh, you know, grab a can of foam. You can do like uh, a gun or even just like the straw stuff. Right. And seal that outside wall where the OSB sheathing meets right there because that's that's probably another thing that was causing it, right, is air getting into that leaky area and then touching the wall area. Right. Touching the drywall and, and just build up, right? right. Build up right. of heat and cool, heat and cold, hot and cold mixing together and then condensing right there. So seal that so that no air can move through there. Got it. And then, uh, yeah. Yeah, any holes, wire holes that pop through, anything that would would uh, allow air to escape out of the house or get into the house. Got it. Yeah. Seal it. So right. how did you communicate this information to her? Did we able to do it in real time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was able to tell her like exactly what was going on with it. And I just let her know exactly like the way that we were explaining it, that there's a lot of hot air in the attic, right? A lot of hot air in the attic. And when there's no like separation between the two, mm -hmm. this is exactly what happens. Condensation, right. mold, mildew, you know, high humidity, very, very high humidity. And she was in, she was in the, um, like, uh, just outside of Annapolis. So it's already like kind of humid because you're close to the water, right? The water sure. table is very high out there. Sure, sure. But inside of the house, ideally when the AC is running, there's like 50% humidity or less. Right. Right. And she was hitting like upwards before they had the crap the crawl space encapsulation. She was hitting upwards of like sixty to seventy percent humidity inside in her of house. her house. Inside of her house, that's, that's crazy. Definitely a good place for mold to grow. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, and she keeps it. She keeps it relatively dark. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's like prime sure. prime spot for mold to grow. So yeah, I just communicated it over to her like that and. And the rebate was really, really good, so it made sense yeah. to like do everything. Cool. Um, and yeah, yeah. And other than that, too, her, her attic was in very rough shape. It was built in like the seventies, seventies. There's like four inches of, of roughly scattered fiberglass across the top, mm. and huge, huge, huge holes around the kitchen. You see, like a lot of places have like kitchen bulkheads uh, where the cabinets are. Yes. There's the little drop downs and yes. it's just like a dead space for air to move through. And actually I, I found some really, really cool stuff there too, Eric, where there was a, uh, a return duct that was wall panned, right? And then wall panning is not a thing anymore. Wall panning is when you use a drywall cavity. So like back behind the drywall, the framing, the framing that's back there, you use that as like a duct. Right. It's not... Not a thing. Pennsylvania still allows it. They're in their own like world out there. <laughs> uh, but that lead that led right to the kitchen bulkhead. Huh. So you can imagine it's like a horrible, horrible thing, especially when it comes to energy efficiency, right? Where if it's crazy, crazy hot in the attic and you have a return duct that's connected to the attic, the first thing when the system kicks on that's going to happen is it's going to suck a ton of hot air right into the system. Right. And cause humidity right away. Right. Right. And then it's just like distributed all throughout your house. Yeah. There's nothing that's going to stop, stop that from happening whatsoever. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was another cool thing that I saw. And then I saw that, I saw that with infrared, but then also I didn't find it until I did the blower door. Ah. Uh. Because I didn't have any kind of negative pressure, right? Like I didn't have any kind of suction to show me any of that. Once I turn the blower door on, you get the negative pressure in the house. Everything, all the air from outside of the house and in the attic comes into the house from the leaking cavities. And right. I was able to find that. I was able to find that. And I could feel it when I turned the, the blower door on. That's what drew me to it. Right. Is I turned the blower door on and I could feel all this hot air coming. The, the duct was like right by the front door, right behind the front door, ultimately. Got it. Uh, so I turned the blower door on. I'm like, where's all this hot air coming from? So I turn around, look at it, stick my hand in front of it. And I'm like, this is crazy. 
So, like, uh, so you're saying that you felt hot air coming through the return. Through the return. Yeah. Only okay. one side of it though. Only one side of it because the, the wall blocker, when I uh, verified it from, from the attic air, the, the, when they did uh wall pans, they would put a two by four on the top of the wall to, to make sure that it was like sealed off. Right. Mm -hmm. So that all the air was coming specifically from that, like from that duct where they put it like, or they'd put some kind of like metal, metal flashing over top of it right, to, right. to keep it from. So, because their, their mentality was if we put a piece of wood over top or a piece of metal, that's going to block the air. Right. Yeah. But it doesn't okay. block everything. Right. Right. You know, so, a, a HVAC system is powerful. It, it pulls, and I've seen them go up to like 2000 CFMs, right? right? Yeah. So if that, all that air, 1500, let's say, I think her system was set at 1500 CFMs. 1500 CFMs distributed from, from three returns because there's only three returns in the house. 500 CFMs of air being pulled through that return right. is going to suck a ton of hot air through the system. Yeah. Just make everything work harder. Right. But you were saying they did, they blocked it up the, the top. Is that what we, did you finish your thought there? They, they blocked one side, they right. blocked the right hand side, but they did not block the left hand side, which is why uh, I was feeling all that air moving through the left hand uh, side. It's just like an open, like if you look at it from the attic. Some yeah. pictures too that I can. Yes. So if you yes. look at it from yes. the attic, it's literally just like an open wall frame that I could stick my hand into. Right. So, okay. One thing I want to mention about that. Number one, the really cool thing, and I always tell people this, it, when a blower door test is running in your house and it's set the right way, or not the right way, but the way where it's depressurizing or pulling the air out, anytime you feel air moving a draft or flow of air you know it's coming from the outside so you put your hand up to the return you felt the hot air you're like oh something's wrong here you knew it was coming from the outside um okay so what did i want to say about that oh i think that oh this is what i wanted to say <laughs> let me ask you this i don't know if you're going to remember this what was right. the age of the home 70s <laughs> so 70s. yeah and what year is it 23 50 Three, 50 years that house has been just working inefficiently for 50 yeah. years. 50. Yeah. Because you're because yeah. she's getting the work done, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah she's, getting, cool. she's getting the work done. Yeah. 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 50 years. Yeah. Amazing. And imagine how much like the longevity on that though. Like if it would have been done. I mean, obviously, right, it wasn't established until like 2012. Mm. Our, ask, our yeah. format. Like, right. The, the amount yeah, of money that could be yeah. saved yeah, is like insane. Well, I think about that, but, and, and don't get me wrong, that's really important, but I just think about too, the comfort, you know, right. it's just, yeah. and, and how many HVAC systems did they buy through the years or whoever owned the house through the years? Three. Because three, you three. know, <laughs> that's a lot too, man. Yeah. When you think about like, well, 50, 25 year longevity, yeah, that's one yeah. over, that's exactly. one over, uh, like normal. Okay. Here's the kicker. And, and this is just, you know, it could, it could happen. It might not, but was the house, does she complain about dustiness? Oh, uh, not, not okay. really. No, okay. no, 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 not particularly, but I have had that before. Yeah. That's yeah. a ton. Yeah. A ton, yeah. yeah. Cool. Yep. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Eric, what are uh, the highlights of, of this past week for you? What have you had interesting pop up? Good question. Thanks. Yeah. So this week, Kyle was a little slower and that's to be expected. I think in home performance, I feel like when the temperature on the outside and the temperature on the inside of your house are about the same, then, you know, typically people are not in tune with the problems that are going on. So the calls are down. So right. for me this week, I had to do a little bit of brushing up on studying and getting recertified because as a, an envelope professional and a um, building analyst, as you know, we have to keep our certification current. So I took a online course and I did learn something pretty cool. And I, it was something that I did not really think about. And it's been something that has, you know, eluded me for whatever it's been now, five years. And it's not that um, I think that I've missed opportunities for people because I haven't. I think everybody that I work with ends up getting these parts of their house done. But where I'm going with this is I 
love taking people downstairs to the basement during the blower door test to show them how leaky their basement is. That's just something that's really fun for me. It's easy to see. It's always there. There's lots of spider webs. It just, it never gets old to me. Right. So I always talk about, you know, how when you seal the rim joist, you, you keep the humidity out and it's going to help in the winter with, you know, keeping the basement warmer. And I think where I'm going with this, what I missed and what I learned is that the rim joist is also really important because if it's not sealed and insulated properly, you're going to get a lot of drafts around the floor. You're also going to get a colder than normal floor. Now, why is that important? Well, it goes back to something we all kind of learn maybe when we're younger, and that is that most of the heat in our body escapes through our head and our hands and our feet. Right. So if you have a really cold floor, that's going to give the average human the impression or the feeling that their house is colder than it maybe actually is, which means they're going to head over to the thermostat and guess what? Turn it up. Right, right. So I, you know, I was thinking this through because it was like profound to me. Like oh, I didn't really explain that to people and the importance and how that also can be a benefit to them in that way. But the good news is that most times when people have the accessibility and I've worked with them, they're always getting their rim joys sealed anyway. So it's not like any opportunity has been missed, but I just thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely, man. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And, and rim joys too is like a sweet spot. It is a sweet spot. It's it's like exactly like you said, very accessible, easy to get to, and super important. Super, super important. important. It's where it's where a stack effect takes place. All right. right, all the air escapes out of the top of the house and then gets sucked in and funneled through the basement and then right through the house and then yep. the cold floor, cold floor yep. and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. So very very important. Yeah. So we are going to. This is our first episode let's do this um i wanted to end each of our little talks about um you know how the home performance with energy star program works and just give right. people little nuggets so for me um one thought i had was you know sometimes i go through and i you know if i maybe just didn't mention it because i got caught up on some other topic and i go down to the water heater and I get my drill out and I drill a hole to right. do my combustion testing. That's something that not a lot of people know because they're like, what was that drill going? What are you doing down there? And it's like, right, right. Oh, <laughs> I'm just drilling a little hole so I can stick my probe in so I can make sure that, you know, the hot water heater is running properly and things like right. that. And I think that's an important part of an energy audit that, you know, not a lot of people know. Sure. Yeah. Like safety testing, safety testing ultimately. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, definitely, man. This has been fantastic. Uh, Eric Gans here, Kyle Farrell. We are going to try to come at you as regularly as possible. And we are going to you know, get to the point and talk a little about things that we find each week. Because one thing I always say is that you know we all live in this great state of Maryland, but we all live in different types of houses, but they're all pretty much built the same and they all have pretty much the same problems. So you can definitely learn from your neighbor on this. So um, thanks for listening. Kyle, you got any last words? No, 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 no. I'm just excited to be here and, and uh, to keep going with this. Yeah. Yeah, man. It'll be fun. Yes, sir. Fun. It, it was going to be good. I think this is a really good episode. And we're just going to, yeah, we're going to keep it going.